Yep, we should be good. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the July 21st, 2020 Town of Cape Elizabeth Planning Board meeting. Um, as a result of the COVID-19 virus, the Planning Board will conduct the meeting via remote access as provided by Maine law. The Planning Board will use Zoom meeting to conduct the meeting and to allow the public to remotely attend and participate. Zoom uh, will allow all Planning Board members, applicants, and members of the public to hear all discussion and hear votes, which will be taken by roll call as required by law. Um, so the first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. Does anyone have any comments or corrections? Uh, hearing none, Jonathan. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Second. Okay. Uh, all approved? Uh, I'm sorry. All in, uh, oh, Maureen, you have to call the roll. I do. Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Mr. Curry? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. Ms. Schott? Yes, sorry, you're not coming through that well. Oh, I'm sorry, oh, and, okay. and Mr. Hubner, who's absent. All right, the motion passes. Next item on the agenda is the uh, Ocean House Common Two Lights Dental Site Plan Revisions. Um, uh, Mark Mueller on behalf of Two Lights Dental is requesting de minimis changes to the architectural design, specifically windows of the building located at 326 Ocean House Road, which previously received site plan approval. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-9 site plan regulations. Uh, and Maureen, a quick question. The application is on the cons consent agenda um, do we still have the uh, applicant present the changes to us? That's your choice. Um, I'd like to see it. I wasn't 100% clear. That doesn't count as substantive discussion though, right? Um, no, and, okay. and it does, even if it did, it's, it's fine. All right, so Matt, can you go ahead? Um, and are we clear on you? Uh, sure. Um, Maureen, oh, as, Maureen, you have this on your screen, right? Can everybody see this? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Matt, do you want to move this around and be host or do you want me to do it? Um, no, I think Maureen, you can do it. It's not a problem. Um, okay. Thank you board for uh, your time this evening. Um, Basically, where we're at is as we started developing the final construction documents for the project here, um, a few window locations um, became tight and possibly problematic for snow buildup and um, just flashing and getting good construction details. So um, the three windows you see here were reduced from two pairs. Um, and then the applicant also wanted to add windows at the rear elevation for additional views. Um, and um, on the side elevations, we had two small little awning windows at the dormer cheek walls, the end walls. And those, once we started looking at manufacturers and we had something locked in, they were just a little too close to the roof and a potential you know, flashing problems. So those were reduced and moved as well. Um, and, and that's it. Okay. So it's nothing on either of the facing elevations that figured into the uh, calculations, right? That is absolutely correct. Okay. So the item is on the consent agenda. So is there any board member who wishes to have any kind of substantive discussion on this? Great, okay. Uh, do I have a motion? Anyone? 
Should I call? I'm just, I'm just going through my papers. So okay. we need a completeness and approval. Question. That's a question. Yeah, not for, not for the minimum. I thought it was just a motion for approval. I think you can just do approval if you want to just go with that. It, okay. Usually I leave motions out. Looks like I added a few in. <laughs> you just got carried away. All right. Motion for the board to consider. Motion for approval. Findings of fact. Mark Mueller on behalf of Two Light Dental is requesting de minimis changes to the architectural design, specifically windows of the building located at 326 Ocean House Road, which requires review under section 19-9 site plan regulations. The 326 Ocean House Road site plan has been previously approved by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to be in compliance with the site plan regulations and the findings and decisions of the prior approval, which are not altered by the proposed amendments remain in effect. The proposed building elevation changes comply with the town center design standard the application substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Mark Mueller on behalf of uh, Two Lights Dental for de minimis changes to architectural design, specifically windows of the building located at 326 Ocean House Road be approved. Do I have a second? Okay. Okay, Peter Curry. Maureen, would you please take a roll call? Sure. Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Mr. Curry? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hubner? Who is muted? <laughs> Oops. I said I am staying. I just joined in, so I was not present for the discussion. Okay. Uh, Ms. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. Mr. Shillai? Yes. Mr. Shillai? Yes. That's 6-0 to approve. Great. The motion passes. Thank you, Matt. Great. Thank you, guys. Have a great evening. You too. Take care. Okay, the next item on the agenda. The town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting amendments of the previously approved site plan for the school campus located at 12 Scott Dyer Road to extend the access ramp across the athletic field complex from the end of the phase one ramp to the tennis courts. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19.9 site plan regulations. Um, so uh, we'll begin with the applicant um, summarizing the project after which we'll make a determination of completeness. And Maureen, uh, do we need to have a public uh, comment on completeness? Typically you would ask the applicant to make a presentation and then you would open an opportunity for okay. public comment on completeness. Perfect. Okay. I think the so, applicant is represented by Steve Harding. Yeah, is uh, Bob on the line, Maureen? Yes, he I, is. I'd probably let Bob go first to make an introduction, and then I can pick up on that. So, uh, thank you for that, Steve. Uh, thank you, uh, board. Uh, uh, my name is Bob Malley. I'm the director of public works, uh, representing the applicant. Um, you'll recall that we undertook an earlier phase of uh, uh, these accessibility improvements earlier this year. Uh, phase one involved a access uh, access way from the central parking lot of the middle school down to a viewing area just west of the Holman Field. Uh, it's proposed to continue with our improvements from that viewing area down in a southerly direction and to connect onto a, a existing walkway that leads from a parking lot at the high school over to the high school tennis courts. So uh, we, the town has been uh, working with the firm of Sebago Technics uh, 
on this project. Uh, Steve Harding, our town engineer, is the lead, and his associate Dan Danvers is also on line with the meeting. So, uh, Steve, uh, I guess I'll pass it over to you for uh, an overview of the project. Okay, thank you, Bob. Well, as you recall from, the, as Bob mentioned, we uh, completed what was phase one of the project. And uh, during that uh, discussion period, uh, it was brought up that there should be a connection from the end of that phase one area by the, uh, the viewing stand by the right field, um, right field of the baseball field and connect to the tennis courts. Uh, so that's, this is what this project would accomplish. It also completes, I believe it's called the town, the cross town trail. Uh, there's a batting cage right beside the baseball field with a, a, a trail symbol on it. And there's also one down by the tennis courts. Uh, so this would clearly mark the path that one would take if they were trying to go through there. And it, it does a lot to uh, control the, the walkway and kind of uh, directs people as to where to go. Uh, essentially, um, the path is about uh, 426 linear feet long. It'll be five feet wide standard path width um, that covers about 2,159 square feet. Uh, there's also a portion of the existing walkway between the parking lot uh, near the tennis courts and the tennis courts that will be uh, re peeling the pavement off there, regrading and resurfacing. So we get a, a more consistent surface along that area. The existing wooden bridge that passes over the drainage course would remain. Uh, we'll have two granite curb pieces to transition from the wooden bridge to our new walk and uh, the wooden bridge would uh, would remain under this uh, project. Um, the total disturbed area is a little bit under 12,000 square feet. Um, we have some utilities uh, that we're avoiding. There is on the westerly side a electrical line that runs uh, alongside the multi-purpose field and the tennis courts and to the uh, we'll actually go under by the batting cage, uh, some sewer and storm drain utilities, but uh, we're, we're passing those at grade, so we're not anticipating any impacts with those at all. Um, this project would qualify for the DEP exemption uh, for school campuses, which we've used before. Uh, we will report the, the amount of disturbance or the, I believe the terms uh, disturbed and non-revegetated area to the DEP at the end of the year uh, with the the other projects that have gone on in the school. Um, we uh, are asking for a waiver of the boundary plan and the right title of interest. Those, uh, co uh, those components are on record at the town and that's a standard uh, waiver request for any school project that we've done. Um, there's no real change in the parking. There is one handicap sign that's missing under an existing handicap space down in the um, existing parking lot. Uh, Bob's crew is going to install that sign and it'll match the one that's there now. Um, the uh, drainage, um, it's under 10,000 square feet of impervious area, so no, uh, no stormwater study was required. Uh, all of the paved areas, it's a linear path. It will sheet flow into the grass areas around it, which will act as a low impact development uh, feature. Um, so there, there should be no issues with that. Um, we, uh, again, know a lot of the standard uh, site plan issues that you normally run up against, uh, we're not changing or they're not applicable. There's no solid waste. Uh, there's no landscaping component to this. No new lighting, no new signs other than the replacement sign of the ADA space. Um, there's no exterior storage and uh, issues like noise will not be impacted like through this or traffic or, or parking. Um, Todd Gammon did a peer review of it. He's an engineer with Blaze. Um, and uh, we've actually talked to Todd since then. He picked up on a couple of mislabeled contours that we had, had a good conversation about the grading of the, of the, the uh, pathway. Uh, we did, uh, he suggested we remove some of the landings we had earlier in the design. We still maintained one landing area which is a flat area of five feet long that's less than 2% slope. We did that for a resting spot if somebody were to uh, go all the way up from the, the bottom to the top of the trail. Um, and we've, we're gonna work with Todd and make sure that we've got uh, revisions to the plan. And this is a, a plan that we've been working on um, since uh, the submission that 
kind of uh, updates the, the grading of the trail and provides for a, a smoother transition from the south to the north. Um, with that, I think that's all I had um, and certainly will be available to answer any questions you might have. Joe? Okay, um, I'd Joe? like to, yeah. Um, this is Maureen. Maureen. I just wanna make sure it's clear that um, the plan that I have displayed right now is a revision from what the board has in front of it and a revision from what is online. Um, the applicant is eager to do the construction this summer and has uh, done some regrading to address the issues raised by uh, Todd Gammon. And so the plan in front of you is intended to address those grading issues and we wanted you to see the most up-to-date plan. Okay, that sounds good. Um, I'd like to open the meeting up for public comment if anyone has any comments on the issue of completeness. So if someone, um, if it's all right with the chair, if yes. someone would like to speak um, as an attendee, you would need to use the raise hand function on the bottom of the screen. And I'm looking to see if anyone is raising their hand. And um, I don't see anyone. Okay, then the uh, public comment session is closed. Um, so this looks very complete to me. Do any of the members of the board have any issues on the matter of whether this is incomplete? No. No, um, looks good. Can we get a motion then? Joe, I have a motion. Good. Uh, motion for completeness be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted in the facts presented the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for an amendment of the previously approved site plan for the school campus located at 12 Scott Dyer Road U21-12 to extend the access ramp across the athletic, com uh, athletic field complex from the end of the phase one ramp to the tennis courts be deemed complete. Waivers have been granted for from submitting the property deed and the property boundary because the information is already on file with the town office as part of the original site plan approval. Do I have a second? Second. Great. Maureen, can you take a roll call? Certainly. Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Mr. Curry? <clears throat> yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hubner? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. Mr. Shalott. Yes. Motion passes. The application is deemed complete and we will now begin uh, deliberations. Unless anyone has any issues with that. Um, first, again, uh, open the, I'd like to open the hearing to public comment. Does anyone have any comments on these, any substantive issues of the plan before us? Maureen, do you see any hands raised? Okay, so again, I'm looking at the attendees list and if anybody would like to speak, you'd need to click on your name and click raise hand. Um, nobody has raised their hand. Okay, then the public comment session is closed. Do any of the board members have question for Steve or Dan or Bob? Uh, Joe, I just, I don't have any questions, but I do have a comment. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, this uh, this is originally came to us in a workshop um, as, and I think it's a very good idea to be able to, uh, hopefully when the kids get back in school, have a handicap accessible ramp down to the tennis court. It was brought to us by the uh, um, Andy Strout, the phys ed teacher at the middle school uh, on the first phase of this project that he does have uh, a young female uh, student that is going to need that handy uh, handicap access to get down to the tennis courts. Uh, so I think uh, getting this approved uh, tonight would be in the interest of everybody at the school department, especially the individual who's going to have to use this with the hope that they are back in school in the fall. So uh, this definitely does have my support and it's good to see a, uh, a plan like that, uh, like this that's been presented and, and as complete and thorough as it is. Okay, any other comments or questions? Yeah, Joe, this is Dan. Um, I just wanna compliment Steve on a great design. Um, Steve, I just have one question, the 5%. I, I've walked that hill before um, 
because my my one of my kids plays tennis and um it's pretty steep and i see you've got the contractor needs to hold to five percent you think he can do that I, did you guys do a survey of this or um just question yeah no that's a good question uh that's the, the really the genesis of the project we did definitely do a field survey of this um okay. the way that we are able to get that five percent you can see the bends in the the path uh, yep. we've actually lengthened the path it's uh not the straightest line uh, from point A to point B, and Dan yep. has a real good job of trying to um, stretch the path out so that we can get that 5%. We do have a little five foot uh, long uh, landing area in the middle of it, and then we, uh, we stay under 5%. I believe overall the path is generally about 4.8%. Okay. The path is, uh, there's a little bit of a flat area there, and the the lower sweeping curve has a little bit of a flatter area. It's like three and a half percent. Uh, so we're trying to try to fit it into the landscape. And then if we go over the 5%, according to ADA, we would need a handrail. And we definitely wanted to try to avoid that. One, it would look awkward and it obviously would add cost to the, to the project. So we're trying to create a linear curvy uh, mm -hmm. pathway. Yeah, great. Thanks, Steve. Yep. Anything else? Um, so, Steve, is this is this a final design that's accomplished that five percent everywhere? Or are you still tweaking it? No, we we we've got it uh, to five percent. We may uh, just uh, obviously we want to we'd have to uh, present this to Todd Gammon and get his his blessing on it. As I would assume a condition of the approval of the board was were to approve this project tonight. Um, so there may be some tweaks to it, but we believe we have it. We haven't really changed the horizontal alignment much. We've, we've taken uh, some of the, the landings we had out and softened some of the curves, but uh, this should be the uh, close to the final plan if it's not the final plan. All right. Um, so unless anyone has anything else, uh, I'm ready for a motion. I'll get a motion for you, Joe. Um, Thank you, John. Motion for approval, findings of fact. The town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting an amendment to the of the previous approved site plan for the school campus located at 12 Scott Dyer Road, U21-12, to extend the access ramp across the athletic field complex from the end of the phase one ramp to the tennis courts, which requires review under section 19-9 site plan re regulations. The school campus site plan has been previously approved by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to be in compliance with the site plan regulations and the findings and decisions of the prior approval, which are not altered by the proposed amendments remain in effect. The plan for the development reflects the natural capabilities of the site to support development. The plan does provide for a system of pedestrian ways within the development. The plan does provide for adequate collection and discharge of stormwater. The development will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion plan submitted. Um, uh, the development is uh, designed to accommodate existing utilities. Uh, the applicant has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capabilities to complete the project. Uh, the application substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and the materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for an amendment to, of the previous Previously approved site plan for, for the school campus located at 12 Scott Dyer Road, U21-12, to extend the access ramp from across the athletic field complex from the end of the phase one ramp to the tennis courts be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that the plans be revised to address the comments of acting town engineer Todd Gammon in his letter dated July 15, 2020. Number two, that there be no alteration of the site until the plan is revised to address the above condition and submitted to the town plan. I'll second. Great. Um, any questions or comments? Maureen, can you take a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Mr. Curry? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hubner? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Starbeck? Yes. Mr. Shalott. Yes. Motion passes. Joe, Joe, can I just say one thing real fast? Yes, Jonathan. Uh, I just want to say uh, congratulations to uh, Bob Malley uh, for your retirement, since this will probably be the last time you're in front of our board. 
uh, in your official capacity. So thanks very much for all you've done for the town. Yes. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I uh, appreciate that very much. And I want to thank the board for their consideration and expedited review of the project. I also want to thank Steve and his team, uh, Dan Danvers, for uh, working on this project and uh, getting it ready. And uh, we have, uh, we, we hope to open bids. We plan on opening bids for it on uh, July 30th uh, and hopefully uh, get an early start on construction for the eventual start of school. So thank you very much. I appreciate all your help. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda. Michael Friedland doing business as Yam Yams LLC is requesting site plan review to operate a village retail lumber store in the existing 1980 square foot building located at 287 Ocean House Road. The application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 19.9, Site Plan Regulations, and Section 19.6.4, Town Center Zoning District Regulations. Um, we'll begin by having the applicant summarize the changes made to the application since the last meeting, uh, and then we will follow that with a public comment period and then the board can begin their deliberations. So uh, who's here on behalf of uh, Yam Yams? Um, Joe, I, I just need a moment to get plans up and okay. promote people. Thank you very much. All right, so I believe that Jim Fisher and Alyssa and Mike are here. And of course, my first question is, uh, do one of you want to be host to um, display the plans? Uh, that would probably, I'm going to volunteer Alyssa to do that because she, her plans are probably more detailed than uh, the site plans where there's not a whole lot to go over on the site plans. Um, I don't have your site plans, so I don't know if you want to send it to me so I can display them or... Um... I have them. I can put them up and... That'd be great. Okay. Is there any particular plan you want? Uh, you can go to the site plan, Maureen. The one that, yeah, there you go, right there. Just let me, let me know when you're set. Are you set? Yes. Are we good? Right. Well, what do you want to do next? I beg your pardon? Pardon? Did Joe? You yeah. Do you want to... Are we having the applicant go over the yeah. plans? Are we I'm doing sorry. public yeah. comment? Let's, have the, let's start with the applicant reviewing the plans and we can do the public comment. Okay. Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, begin. This is Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil, obviously here with uh, Alyssa and Michael. Um, there's not a whole lot to go over as far as the actual site plan is concerned uh, from last time. I would mention that there are a couple of note changes uh, pursuant to a request by the board. Those are on the plan. Uh, one of the other things that we added was the, uh, the crosswalk, as you see it, that uh, cuts right across the parking lot and goes right into almost to the front doors of the building. Uh, we have added a note about that that is shown on the or within the confines of the building uh, that explains about the um, outdoor retail sales venue 
which is just a few seasonal items that would be offered uh, for display outside underneath the eave. Uh, that's outside on the front sidewalk of the building underneath the eave. Uh, anything that's put out there on a daily basis will then be brought in uh, as far as security is concerned, but would stay out there during the day for again, these seasonal items. And then uh, we're still waiting for the DEP's VRAP um, to be able to come back to both us and the town. Uh, it's more time is passing and uh, they're busy, they're getting to it. They've now had it for about uh, three months and it's coming or so we're told, but we don't have it yet. Obviously when it does come, we'll send it right over to you, but it's going to the town directly anyway. Uh, other than that, what, we're like, what we'd like to do this evening is put this to bed if possible. Certainly uh, willing to entertain any questions or comments, but we'd like to be able to get the approval with conditions this evening, uh, basically as Maureen has written them up. After Alyssa is done speaking to you about the, the building changes and uh, any comments that Michael might make when the, or when the board does go into its um, conversations and then we start talking about the conditions of approval, uh, the vast majority of them, there's absolutely no issue. We can we confer with most of them. Uh, there are a few that we'd like to discuss, uh, but in lieu of that, unless you've got any questions about the actual site plan, Alyssa can certainly go into uh, any of the changes in the building details. Thank you. Okay, Alyssa. All right. Uh, Maureen, would you like me to share my screen or we can just uh, flip to the elevations as well? I have no problem with making you host. Okay, let me... <laughs> Oh, if you don't want to, it's fine. I can put up whatever you need. Um, just the elevations would be great, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, great. Uh, so architecturally, um, very little has changed since the last planning board meeting. The entry door, um, has now been updated to reflect the actual product. So there is gonna be two sliding doors that slide out. Uh, the new dormer over the new sliding door entry um, kind of led to the discovery that there is a huge uh, beam that is part of that raised ridge assembly. So the owner will keep that and reside the raised ridge assembly. So we will not be removing that uh, what we thought was decorative, but it actually has a structural component to it. So we will be keeping that. Um, and if you scroll down to the floor plans, we also added some note changes for clarity of um, function, as well as the layout that has been updated based on the new single door entry from the last meeting. And with that, I believe are the only architectural changes since the last planning board meeting. Okay, great. Um, so I'd like to open up the uh, meeting to public comment period. Uh, I assume there are some people out there who wish to speak, Maureen. Uh, if, actually, if you wish to speak, it would be a good time to raise your hand right now. There are 23 attendees. Yeah, and um, I'm looking for one of them to uh, raise their hand. So you just click on your name and at the bottom it says raise hand and um, uh, we have one person who wants to raise their hand. Do you want to open the public comment and explain okay. name and address and time? All right. Yes. Yeah. So we will open the meeting to public comment. So you'll have three minutes to speak. Um, please begin by stating your name, spell your last name, and state your address. And then you can go ahead and speak. Okay, and the stating of your name and address will not count in your three minutes. Okay. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yep. All right, this is Cindy Boltz. I'm at 33 Phillip Road. Um, my last name, Boltz, V-O-L-T-Z. And I wanted to comment in support of the plan that's proposed for the lumbery. Um, and I read through some of the meeting materials and noticed there is a um, concern over the requirement, or I, I guess the recommendation, to install town lighting around the perimeter of the building. And um, I, as a neighbor of this property, I'm, I'm just really excited to see it developed. I appreciate all the effort that's going into the development of this property and, and um, removing the eyesore from the neighborhood. And I know it, there's been a lot of um, 
personal expense and work put into it by the property owner. And I think requiring um, the additional lighting um, for town purposes is, um, could be a detriment to development of the property and I would hate to see that happen. So I'm here to, um, in, in support of uh, the town putting in the lighting in this off premise area and not making that a requirement of the property owner. And um, I had it, you know, a few years ago when the Hillway property was under development, there was a similar situation uh, during the site review of the Tarbox Triangle and um, the sidewalk at the time did not go around the full perimeter of this triangle of Ocean House Road, Hillway and Scott Dyer Road. And the developer at the time requested a waiver from the um, sort of construction standard. Again, it wasn't a requirement, but there was a construction standard expected to install a small section of sidewalk on the Scott Dyer side of the property. And the developer requested a waiver for that. Um, and at the time I wrote in support of having a sidewalk on the side of that property, but the decision by the planning board at the time was that, that it was not necessary to put the burden on the developer and the property owner at that time and the city later put in that portion of sidewalk as part of the Scott Dyer improvements. And I hope that the planning board will consider that and um, act similarly in this situation so that the property owner is not required to put in the town lighting around the perimeter of the property. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Maureen, anybody else? Yes. Um, I think Zeb, you're ready to go. Yes. Uh, can you hear me, Maureen? Yes. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zeb Mowitz. Uh, that's spelled M as in Mary Y E R O W I T Z. I reside at 12 Hill Way. I am the immediate abutter, um, as the and also the developer mentioned in uh, Cindy's prior comments. Um, I want to clarify a couple points that Cindy made, but then also reinforce my support for the development. Um, to clarify on Cindy's prior statement or to add uh, maybe a correction to it, uh, uh, she is correct that we were required, uh, we were allowed to defer our development of the sidewalk for the subdivision of our, our three subdivision lot that was not yet being developed. Um, however, the, the development uh, that was done by the town was was uh, not an intentional development. Uh, the burden was supposed to be placed upon us and that's not exactly how that happened. Um, yeah, I think it was done as part of the bid process, but I'm just providing that clarification. Um, but moving forward, I support the development. Uh, I think it's, it's great to again see that that building is being uh, used. I think it's gonna really help to improve uh, one of the, the landmark buildings in our town. Um, I would also like to just offer a second opinion uh, that reinforces, you know, the support that I, I don't feel, you know, I, 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 in reviewing the planning board submission requirements in a new development, it does make sense that if the developer is going to be implementing infrastructure, such as putting down sidewalk where it doesn't exist or adding lighting where it doesn't exist, that there would be a precedent upon having to do things that are in line with the town development. I don't, I don't think that applies to this particular lot, even though I have a, a direct interest in, in it doing so, because again, it would be in line with my adjacent development. Um, I think that I don't see a, a regulation in the planning board that applies to existing buildings that are, are being facelifted. And I don't, I don't think that the development um, goes into the detail where it would be expected for him to then go onto the town's property to make improvements. Um, I just wanted to reinforce my opinion on that side and I am looking forward to seeing this get approved and finally go towards the development process. Great, thank you, Zev. Maureen, is there anyone else who wishes um, to yes, speak? Yes, there is. Okay. Uh, there's a Chris who's now allowed to talk, had his hand up. Yep, hi, um, my name's Chris Gamble, G-A-M-B-L-E. 
I live uh, 10 Woodland Road, and um, I am in support of this project. It seems like a, uh, an exciting project for, that Cape Elizabeth, Cape Elizabeth will, um, could potentially have. And I just think it's, it's exciting to see new, new businesses like this that may be a little different come into our community. And, um, and I did hear about the lighting situation. I just wanted to speak on that as, as a small business owner. I own a business in Portland and just know that putting the burden of, of uh, something like this, I'm not sure what the cost would be, but I can imagine it'd be considerable. Putting that burden on a business owner that's trying to get things up and running, especially in these times, um, is is substantial. And I I don't I haven't looked into the regulations or or I don't know if this is required or where you know this you know how the lighting um, you know what is what this what the town requires in terms of the lighting, but uh, for the business owner, but. All I can say is that if there's any way that it can help a business owner um, open his business, get his doors open, um, I would be in support of that. So um, I just think, I just feel like uh, you know help, helping helping them out in any way they can is uh, would would be would be great. I, I know how hard it is to start a business, and um, so anything that can be done by the town to get this thing off the ground, I think would be helpful. And that's all I got. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Chris. Anyone else, Maureen? Yes. Steinman? Steinman has their hand up and you're now allowed to talk. Hello? Can you hear me? This Hello. is Adam. This is Adam Steinman, live at 49 Shipwreck Cove Road. Um, I've been at every um, meeting on this project, uh, public meeting. I have given counsel to Mike over the last six or seven months. Um, I am fully in support of this project. I've seen it go from something that would have been extremely, extremely exciting for the town to something pared down that he could actually get approved at least at this stage. Um, I have seen the town Im impose significant, significant restrictions on him and burdens on him, of which he has, I think, risen to every single one of them um, to date, even when I've said, I don't know that the regulations really require you to do that. Um, unfortunately, because of where we are, um, both with the pandemic and just being able to get things done. The project's now been on hold for several months. I think a lot of the viability of this project was hinged to being able to open in the summer, of early summer, and having that time to be in business and, and add to our community. That's sort of coming on, but it, it's really time to pass this project and, and get things moving. And I really think Michael and his team has has done everything reasonable and maybe even gone above and beyond that. Uh, I think the last sticking point of town lighting, which may seem like a little thing, but it's not, it's tens of thousands of dollars, is just going to further prolong and discourage business and development in a part of town. We really need something new and exciting. We're sick of looking at the eyesore. Michael's ready to build it out. He's ready to get into business. And he's done as far as the rules are concerned, as far as I can see. And again, I'm a lawyer, um, complied with everything. And I don't see anything requiring him to put in town lighting in this project. And at this point, where he's acquiesced in virtually every other um, recommendation, suggestion, or hope and desire of the council and the board, I think it's really time to get approval. Let's move on, let him finish the project and let's let's have a lumbery and see how it does. Um, and if the town lighting is the sticking point, then I think maybe it's the town should step up. It's not a safety issue and I don't see that it's required. And that's what I have for tonight. Okay, thank you. Maureen, anyone else? Um, yes. Uh, 
Let's see. Glenn? Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, uh, good evening. Um, my name is Glenn Rudberg and I'm speaking on behalf of myself and my wife, Jane Rudberg. Um, I'll keep it short other than to support this project. Um, Mr. Sort of Mr. Watch Rudberg? It. Yes. Uh, I think we need an address. I'm sorry, uh, it's 13 High Bluff Road. Thank and, you. Uh, and my last name is spelled R-U-D-B-E-R-G. I apologize for that. Um, I simply wanna just support, uh, express some support for the project. I don't know the owner well, although I've sort of been watching this from afar. Um, I am absolutely thrilled he's willing to invest in the town. And I've watched him jump through um, a few hoops. Um, and I will leave it to the town as to whether or not uh, in, your, in, in this committees to determine whether or not the infrastructure of the town um, improvement should be funded by a new business owner or, or yourself. But I would hope that we would remove any and all burdens that we possibly can to remove the eyesore and to improve the town. And I'd like to thank the owner for having the courage and the, um, the willingness to stay in, the, in, in this for as long as he has. I, I, we fully support the project and can't wait to see it open. And that's all I wanna say, thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Anybody else, Maureen? Um, I have a I have a Chris here. Have you already spoken, Chris? And we need to lower your hand now. Not hearing anything. I think Chris um, spoke already. I okay. We have another one right here. Douglas. You need to unmute. Hello? Yep. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, my name is Douglas Campbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L, -L, and I live at 259 Ocean House Road. I'm 100 yards north of the, of the proposed site, and uh, I'm fully in support of Mike's vision here. Um, really looking forward to having this uh, site active again with a such an interesting business as he's proposed here. Um, I feel like, you know, we should stop throwing up obstacles in front of him and let him get started on this and get into business. And I am in agreement with everybody else who has said that I really feel like it shouldn't be Mike's responsibility to take care of the lighting on the town property, that the town should be willing to step up for that in order to get this project approved and, and uh, viable. Uh, and that's all I have to say. Uh, just want to express my support for the project in general. Okay, thank you. Anyone else, Maureen? Uh, no one else has their hand raised. Okay, let's just give it a second. Okay, seeing no one else wishing to speak, the uh, public comment period is now closed. Um, does anybody on the board have any questions for the applicant? Joe, I have a question. Go ahead, Jonathan. Uh, with regards to the lighting, can the applicant just give us some information about um, the costs and his representations of how cost prohibitive it's going to be? Um, I can probably do that on behalf of uh, Michael Fradlin. Uh, we actually uh, went through uh, Bob Malley uh, to determine what the actual fixtures would be like. Uh, he was not able to give us specific information, obviously, but uh, he gave us, pointed us in the right direction. So we took a look at the type of fixtures that are offered. Uh, the pole mounted system with the uh, fixture that is mounted on the top of it would be approximately 3,500, less than 4,000, typically a little bit more north of 3,500. Um, then it's the actual uh, installation of the uh, units and uh, the hookup, the running the conduit, uh, the excavation. Uh, in, in some areas, it may actually uh, be impugning on the sidewalk, so there'd be a replacement of the sidewalk involved. Uh, we asked uh, some contractors, just not a scientific vote, but said if we needed to go down X number of feet from where the, con the electrical connection would be to one of the uh, uh, utility poles that's already energized, uh, what typically might that cost be? And we divided that out over the three poles that the town was looking at uh, install, excuse me, installing there. 
and it would be approximately $10,000 per poll, uh, including everything, the fixtures and the labor work to be able to get that co uh, connected. So given the three lights that we're looking at, we're looking generally at speaking at around $30,000 of additional cost to be able to put in just those three poles. Okay, and, and one follow up on that. Jim, did you talk to uh, Maureen or anybody from the town with regards of uh, if there's an opportunity to split that cost or uh, you had mentioned about putting money into escrow as sort of a, um, a, not a donation, but something that would be supportive of the town actually using that money uh, for these lamp poles. Did anything come up from that? Uh, I did not speak specifically with Maureen about that. We did put that in the narrative. Uh, Mr. Friedland has said, you know, he doesn't want to just turn a cold shoulder to be sure. He wants to be able to actually uh, be popular in this particular area and, uh, and open it up as nicely as possible. So he is willing to be able to contribute funds uh, to the light poles, whether they go up in front of uh, or, or along Ocean House Road in front of this particular locus, or if it's further anywhere else in town, as long as it's used for the lighting purposes, he has no objection to that uh, and is willing to give $5,000 to the town toward that end. As far as an escrow account, I don't know how specifically that would work, but we could certainly work with the town toward that end. So again, he does want to contribute just a big difference between $5,000 and excuse me, approximately $30,000 to be able to do that. So Maureen, is that something we could actually put into a condition of approval? That the applicant contribute to offsite improvements? Yes. Yeah, you would have well, to- Well, specifically for lighting. Yeah, you, you would have to make a finding that it is a requirement that the applicant provide offsite lighting improvements, and then you could accept that kind of contribution as meeting the requirement. Okay. Um, does anyone else have thoughts on that? Pete? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Joe. I spent quite a bit of time thinking about this, looking at the ordinance. <clears throat> and it's, it's clear enough that in the town center district, lighting is contemplated. There are no metrics provided as to what it should be. Um, and I think it's really you know, our discretion looking at context. And to me in this site, context is really important. This particular parcel is kind of a, a little bit out in the, in the boondocks of the, of the town center district. It's got a peculiar shape. It's like a little peninsula sticking out and accessible on foot uh, only by crossing uh, some streets, which, you know, are not, would be a whole lot of fun to cross. So I doubt the, the idea of foot traffic is going to be, um, terribly important but as i looked at the plan and i looked at the recent revisions there is the uh, the paver uh, walkway that's going to go from uh, route 77 up to the main entrance which we requested and he's putting in and at that the juncture of that walkway and the sidewalk would seem to me to be a logical place to put such a light of the type we're talking uh, the idea of having two more units um, I'm not sure I see the point or that it's entirely necessary. This is, I'm suggesting this is sort of a compromise to my colleagues on the board. This is only me thinking out loud, but I think a light at that walkway would be visually and uh, appropriate to the, the type of visual effect we're trying to create in the town center. The additional lighting, I'm not sure what that adds to the problem. So if the, if the applicant were to install one light at the walkway, uh, I would suggest that is perhaps a compromise on this lighting issue. And it's one that is, I would feel is in the spirit of the lighting requirement in the ordinance. So can I uh, add something to that? If Hold Peter's on, done. Michael. Let's, I wanna get, go see if anybody on the board has any reaction to what Pete and Jonathan? Yeah, I do. Yeah, actually, I just wanted to say, uh, comment on Peter's comment that actually I had sort of the same thought um, in thinking about the layout of lights and you know coming up with a fair solution given the size of the project and the layout. So, I mean, actually, I mean, it was almost exactly the same thing. 
I don't know. I mean, a question back to the applicant would be, does that still mean you're going to have, now you're putting excavation costs on one light? So maybe you've gone from 30,000 to 27,000 or something, you know, not, it wouldn't be, it would be less than that. So maybe 20,000 or something, but, um, and would it still be burdensome and that maybe, again, the idea to put it in an escrow would be uh, fair enough for sort of future installation for that sort of idea of a light at that walkway. So that, that's my comment. Um, anybody else? Carol Ann, Jim, Dan? Uh, Joe, yeah, Joe, this is Dan. I, I like Peter's idea of um, exploring putting that one fixture at the intersection of the uh, paver path to the sidewalk. I think it's a good compromise. And just a question to the applicant. I know Jim went over that, that they spoke to the town about infrastructure, but you know, how deep did you go with that? Since the town was installing uh, lights and conduit and power on the, uh, on the east side of 77, it just seems to me that you know, there could be a timing issue here where you know that might be able to help out financially but i like peter's idea thanks so uh Joe, sorry, can I John, say something yeah so with regards to peter's um comment i i could see how that could be a good compromise i for one look at the town center uh ordinances that have been uh put in place by the town council and have been in place for a very long time or for probably over 10 years now, which were no surprise when this applicant uh, bought this property and started going for the development. Uh, from my understanding from the, I think this is the fifth meeting, uh, not including the two workshops out and the site walk that we've been on on this. So I think we're going into probably our 10th hour of discussion on this whole project. Um, my, my thought is that the applicant should be uh, required to put in the three lights. Uh, and I say that because to me, the town center ordinance is all about pedestrian, pedestrian friendly access. Um, and that stretch of 77 is part of that property. And to me goes to the pedestrian friendly uh, zoning ordinances that the town council has put in place. Uh, if the town, if the planning board was to go into a sort of a compromise on, on one lighting that they were gonna re be required, uh, I think I could probably live with that, but I sort of side with the idea that the applicant should be required to do the three lights. And I also say that because two other local businessmen uh, who have come in front of this planning board uh, for both sea salt and uh, the um, ocean commons project are also two local businessmen. And I say that because I'm reiterating to the fact that this applicant is also a local businessman. So the idea and the characterization that those other projects were million dollar projects, um, I, that, and we got that correspondence today that was sent to us um, from a posting that the applicant had put on Facebook. I think that's sort of misrepresenting those other projects um, because uh, they did what was asked for by the town. Um, and I think to me that that's what this applicant should be required to do as well. Um, but that's just my view, um, and I could be alone on that, which is fine, but I think it all goes to pedestrian access. I think that that's what the town center's um, zoning is all about, and so I would be require asking, uh, or I would be requiring that the applicant put in those three lights. Um, Jim, you, uh, Andrew actually asked a question that I'm interested in too, as to whether if you just do one light, is that going to cost 10 grand or do you have a lot of cost in excavation? Uh, yes, it's, it's pretty much the latter. Um, the light costs, obviously, for the specific fixtures aren't going to change. So by putting only one light, then we certainly can eliminate the, uh, the cost of the other two fixtures. Uh, but the cost to be able to install the light there, uh, it, it wouldn't be the full cost, obviously, times three of, of $10,000 times three, because we I wouldn't have to go as far down toward the entrance. But uh, other way, we still would have to uh, be able to trench up to the ex one of the existing um, halogen light poles to be able to connect into the electricity the lines there. So that is going to so the trenching for that is going to be less expensive than thirty thousand, but it's still going to be a lot more expensive than ten thousand. Ah, uh, yeah. 
Uh, Jim, Jim, with a with a single unit, is there any possibility of a solar battery? If you're only powering one light, one light unit, does you really, do you really have to tie into the system? Um, I haven't actually looked into a solar battery toward that end. We've done a lot of work uh, on uh, LED signage that is uh, populated by uh, by um, panels, solar panels, uh, but typically they are very limited in terms of when they go on. A light in this case would very likely, especially in the winter months, would probably be on for the better part of eight to 10 hours, uh, unless there's a, a connection or a, a hookup to, uh, uh, to turn it off in the middle of the night, uh, which I don't think is the case. So well, it has the Cobra lights over it. Right, it does have the Cobra lights over it. So yeah. from, from a lighting perspective, there's no issue. Yeah, functionally, it's not a light that we're worried about. It's more the, the visual ambiance of the town center that we're trying to preserve. So the fact that it couldn't be on for eight hours, you know, hours of darkness in the winter, I think is less important. It's, it's something that will illuminate and sort of draw the eye to the welcoming aspect of the, of the property. And, and that I think could be illuminated with much less intensity um, than the normal lighting fixture. That could very well be. If it's a limited amount of time for the power draw, then it is certainly possible to be able to, uh, uh, to have solar panels, uh, say, adjacent to it. I'm not sure it would work on top of it because that may not do the, uh, or, or uh, bode well for the aesthetic, uh, but there could possibly be a, uh, a ground mounted solar panel that would be adjacent to it uh, with a direct cord to it. I, do, I don't have the experience to know how long uh, a solar panel would be able to uh, um, convey power specifically to keep that uh, pole lighted. I just, I don't have that background. Hey, Joseph, uh, is it Jim? Oh, go ahead. Jim, go ahead. Um, a couple parts of my question, um, and it, it's, some of this is by most of it directed at Maureen to provide some information. Um, you've, you've got a table and the information provided to us on, uh, page, page eight at the top of the page of the town center standards. And can you give some background or some historical uh, background because like Peter said there really no are no metrics in the ordinance of what to provide although they do have a couple of the sketches that depict the kind of fixtures that we would like to see but how um, how did that how did the requirement for the fixtures come about and and uh, the, the selection of the fixtures because they're fairly consistent on the ones and then you look at the table some of them have pedestrian lighting and some of them don't. I don't know if that's the timing, but you know, before or after the present ordinance was, uh, was uh, enacted. Uh, so if you just kind of give us some background on these lights and what we've done on other properties. Uh, sure, I, I, and you can tell me when to stop. So the town adopt, just to give you the perspective, the town adopted uh, the town center plan in 1993. And then in 1995, the town actually adopted a town center zone. And the town center zone has the design standards that are, they haven't changed that much since 1995. So what you have in the ordinance, um, those, those original illustrations that talk about what the front facade should look like, those date back to 1995. And that's when the whole discussion happened about uh, sidewalks and how do you pay for sidewalks and there was a when the council I mean both the planning board reviewed the ordinance and then the council adopted it and it was a commitment that uh, when an applicant had to come before the planning board for site plan review they were going to be responsible for adding in the sidewalk and where the town was able to uh, invest in infrastructure improvements the town would construct the sidewalk and I think it was right around 1990 time. And it did get a grant and it, it installed sidewalk on Scott Dye Road from Farm Hill Road all the way up to uh, Ocean House Road and then headed south on Ocean House Road and stopped um, at Jordan Farm Road, at Jordan Way. So when the town put the new sidewalk in, that's when we kind of came up with this uh, specification that was a five foot wide concrete sidewalk separated from the road by a grass desplanade and the width of the grass desplanade 
uh, varies based on how much space we have in the right of way. And then inside the grass desplanade, there would be, there would be street trees and pedestrian lighting. And uh, that's when uh, all of that lighting first started getting installed. And the, the lighting uh, from that point, that kind of became our spec. Uh, and as you can see, some of these projects, the lighting really has been focused on Ocean House Road. Uh, we, we did not require the Hillway project to install pedestrian lighting. They did install uh, street trees and they installed hundreds of feet of brand new sidewalk. So um, I'm just looking at this table working from the bottom. In 2002, um, the town uh, bought the, um, the old Pond Cove Millworks on Ocean House Road and it installed as part of its site plan concrete sidewalk, pedestrian lighting, street trees. And I understand it's the town, but the same thing, it's an applicant, just as the project you just saw was an applicant. Uh, 1226 Shore Road, that project had no sidewalk in front of it, and the applicant wasn't required to, was required to install sidewalk. Um, the Johnson site plan, 1231 Shore Road, there was no sidewalk in front of it. They were required to install sidewalk. Let me be clear that both of those applicants did not want to do that. Um, and they were required by the planning board. The Cape Elizabeth Land Trust installed a sidewalk along Ocean House Road. Did not want to do it, they did do it anyway. Uh, Joan Jonesy's Convenience Store, which is um, now the new Cumberland Farms, that sidewalk that is in, uh, in front of where all the, the gas pumps are, that was sidewalk that was required by the planning board for them to install um, with the street trees. Uh, then we have the sea salt market. They, they did everything that the town did on the other side of the high school driveway. They did the sidewalk, uh, concrete, street trees, and lighting. Um, Cape Chiropractic, all of their improvements were on Hillway. They did not do lighting, but they did build, and Zeb probably can tell you, hundreds of feet of brand new sidewalk, esplanade, and street trees. And they are building Maureen, um, we just we I'm just lost you about, oh okay um ocean house road uh right next to town hall they're building probably 300 feet of public sidewalk lighting street trees and that's not including um anything inside on the village green that's just along the frontage with ocean house road so i do understand that um Applicants, developers are not excited about spending money off-site to do these improvements, but it is a long-standing decision by the town council. It was actually questioned in 2003. The whole, the whole policy was uh, reviewed by the council and they recommitted to it. And as you can see, um, the town has not had um, the money to invest in sidewalk infrastructure, uh, except for that one grant in 1999. Now, with the new town center plan that was adopted in 2013, we have created a TIF account and we are using uh, the monies that are starting to accumulate in that as match to stretch some grant money. So that's why that uh, project that's across the street from this is underway right now. And we also have grant money that we're hoping to spend in the next two years to put in sidewalk in front of uh, the Pond Cove Shopping Center all the way down to Fowler Road. But I just want to make sure it's clear that, um, you know, finding the money to put these improvements in place has been almost impossible. So uh, this has been the choice of the council to ask, uh, to require uh, property owners to pitch in to the public right of way. And I, I just want to make sure it's clear because there seems to be some uh, idea that if it's on town property that no one's responsible for it but the town, it is incredibly common for developers to be responsible for making off-site improvements. Uh, off-site improvements happen with traffic all the time in the town of Cape Elizabeth, in the town center. Uh, sidewalks are often constructed in the right-of-way as part of new development. And I'll stop there. I'm, I'm hoping I answered your question. Okay. Um, yes, thank you. Do you any idea 
Uh, I wasn't on board why we didn't make a few of these places put lights in, but there's just not enough frontage or? Uh... I think that the lighting really became a focus along Ocean House Road. That's where we're really focusing on it. And you can see that um, most of the people that had frontage on Ocean House Road were the ones that were putting in the pedestrian lighting. So Maureen, did um, sea salt pay for the light that went in there? And the, the improvements to the road for the yes, they, they bought the light, they bought the trees, they 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 took no, on the whole no, road no, the and yeah, traffic they, light. I'm talking uh, about the no, there and actually there there was a um, sea salt, there was a prior developer of the sea salt property who was asked by the town to contribute to that traffic light and they chose not to develop their property and um, the town did put that light in. And as part of uh, some traffic, good, in my opinion, good traffic access management, um, the sea salt property owner was encouraged to put their exit onto the high school driveway so they could take advantage of that light. And they did obtain an easement from the town to do that. So I just think, I think that's a great example of how the town and a private property owner can share existing infrastructure to mutual benefit to, to better public safety. Okay. Um. Hey, Joe, if there's a moment I'd like to uh, be able to contribute. Uh, this is Mike Friedland. All right. um, what I want to ask the board is, do you want to, move on to something else and come back to the lighting or do you want to try and make a final decision before we do anything else i think uh joe i think i'm the only one who hasn't commented on the lighting and my inclination is <laughs> is different than the other is to um, a contribution to a fund, a fund to do the lighting at a later date in conjunction with a town plan would be something I would favor. My second choice would be Peter's suggestion of, uh, of a light, which I don't think saves them that much because there's usually um, cost savings in numbers. So if you're going to you know, do the digging to set the infrastructure to put in one light, you might as well put in more because it's the infrastructure that's really gonna cost you some money. So anyway, I would be in favor of, uh, of a contribution to a fund for subsequent lighting. All right, so I haven't actually weighed in yet either, but I'm glad you said that, Carol Ann. Um, you know, I was thinking if I went back to the way beginning and was uh, saw this as in a workshop and discussed the general scale of the project. I might be swayed that three lights fully installed were too much for this property owner to bear on this project. And I would be I think I would be okay with um, the owner contributing to the cost of three lights uh, and uh, with a second choice of one light installed. I think that's how I would go with it. Uh, Carol Ann, do you have a number in mind or are you looking at Michael's offer of 5,000? Well, I'm thinking the cost of three lights and you know, something on the order of three grand, thirty-five hundred per light. I just don't think it'll ever happen if you do that. I think it'll get put in the fund and people forget about it. No, it'll never happen. Well, yeah, Joe. If I can just add, uh, I, I think your idea is a good one. But the, 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 I, I keep coming back to the context. This is a really weird parcel. It's sitting out there all by itself. Nobody's going to walk to it, that I can imagine. I, I, think well, I, we're think, talking, I think we're talking about a 
cosmetic feature and, and you know if, whether they, they contribute to the bigger lighting picture or put in one I, I just think that we're, what we ought to be coming up with is a reasonable compromise because this is a strange parcel that's going to be very tough to develop and I think it's in order to to insist on the visual aspect of the lighting but but not get too hung up on pedestrian uh, foot traffic safety because I just don't think it's going to be it's, it's going to happen over there. Could, could I say something about yes. pedestrian? Uh, I would suggest that you go up to that corner at somewhere between 2.30 and 3 o'clock in the afternoon and see how much pedestrian traffic there is. No, but we're talking um, nighttime. We're talking darkness, Carolyn. Uh, still, you know, you're talking pedestrian. There, there is, it's, people don't walk on sidewalks that don't exist. You have to build them. You build them and they will come. That, that is a given. That's the way it works. <laughs> happens with baseball fields, happens with sidewalks. Well, it, um, at night, I disagree. I don't think it'll happen. So, I, I don't know. On a night like tonight, you might find people in that neighborhood find it as a nice, a nice way to go for a safe walk. Well, would everybody agree that we're kind of between Peter's idea of one light and a fund for three lights? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right. Should we take a vote? No. <laughs> it takes too long. <laughs> should, we do, should we take a vote at the end? No, so I think it. The thought going through my head on the fund was between the five and ten. Was between five and ten grand. Okay, Joe, would it be appropriate to ask the applicant to uh, chime in if he has any thoughts to add to this discussion? Uh, yes, we can do that. Okay, Michael. Um, oh, thank you. Thanks for the time, and I I just appreciate all the effort that that you guys are doing, that everyone's doing, trying to sort this out and figure it out. It's it's not easy. It's not cookie cutter. I recognize that. Um, and I recognize that there's precedent and I, I've really read through the code numerous times and, and, uh, and, and, it, and it's not clearly defined um, lighting on town property because uh, as Maureen cited, it was town lighting within the, um, the setback, the grass esplanade, which is actually on my property. So the reference to new lighting is on my property, not on town property. So. It was hard for me to be proactive in creating a budget for something that I actually couldn't discern from the code. It, it wasn't clearly written. And as, as Maureen elaborated, there is a big history, but me coming in as an applicant, I don't know this history. So it's hard for me to create a budget on a history that I'm not aware of regarding a precedent from past applicants. You know, all I have to work with is the code in front of me. And, and as I stated, I could not discern within the code a requirement for me to install town lighting. And uh, there's also many references to new developments putting in sidewalks. Um, there already is sidewalk there. And, and if the town would rather me put in a better sidewalk instead of town lighting as a contribution, I would gladly do that. But uh, the cost burden for a pre-existing site to tear up the ground and run new wires, um, the cost of coordination effort and the disturbance uh, it is, is fairly stressful on me and it's also fairly cost prohibitive. And, um, and I know a lot of the, the participants mentioned this, but starting a small business is very hard. Um, cash flow is the number one priority for all small businesses and uh, we already put off classes and the, one of the reasons we put off classes is because uh, it would require a fire alarm system, a fire sprinkler system and handicapped access. So any money that I'm putting towards uh, items that uh, such as lighting is also going to take away from me developing a business that uh, can succeed and that can enhance the community. So, um, so it, so I guess my points are, A, I did not see it coming. I, I've read through the code numerous times and, and I do not have a history with the town, so I could not predict that install, buying and installing lighting for the town on town property would be part of this. Um, I, I do not see it in the code. And, um, and then it's just, it's expensive and it's very hard starting business, especially 
during a pandemic and every penny counts. Um, uh, I'd be happy to contribute uh, to a fund um, and I could even be in charge of that fund to make sure this lighting does happen at some point. But um, at this time, my goal is to get the store open and there, there are already so many hoops I have to jump through in that regard. Um, and I, I, again, I appreciate the effort of the planning board. I know this is not easy. Uh, it's not cookie cutter. It's a strange property. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of mistakes, um, but I would like to move forward. I'd love to get approval. I'd love to open a business and I'd love to keep my costs low if possible. That, okay. that help? Yeah, thank you, Michael. All right, so is, any, is there anybody in favor of just an up or down vote on what we want to do about the lighting before we move on? Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess. All right, all right. Let's hold off on that and then move on. Um, I don't know if any of you reviewed the uh, uh, findings of fact here. Um, but are, are there any that, that you want to discuss and make sure we all agree on? other than the lighting pardon me i have two that i put question marks on okay what are they uh number 17 about substantially increasing noise levels have we come to the conclusion that based on where we're at now that that it will not substantially increase noise level that's my yeah that's my understanding okay and number 19, the site and building design. It's, uh, we had a long discussion at the last meeting about roof pitch. Yeah. And so the design standard is what, 712? Am I remembering? And it's yes, I think we were leaning towards the fact that the existing pitch is 512, and so and we accepted the yes. How do we is board? 5 on 12. How do we word its compliance with the design standards when we're allowing an existing building? And I'm in favor of that. I just want to say that. It, it does. It says something in the standards about the existing building, right, does Maureen? It? Yes, it does. Oh, okay. So if it's existing, so yeah. And um, other than that, there wasn't much change. We find we figured out what that extra piece on the top was for. Yep. So that stays. Did everybody catch that? Yes. The the little bump in the ridge at the top that originally was going to get that's it's just in the very latest drawings that got emailed to us. Can you pull that up a second, Maureen? And point to it. Yeah, so that piece, that's a that little quirky bump in the top of the ridge. And originally they were going to remove it, but then they discovered a structural beam in there, so they're keeping it. I like it, so <laughs> I don't have an issue with it. Oh. I'll just, I'll just go on record as saying um, this project has come a very, very, very long way from the first time we saw it to um, it has improved greatly, gone through a lot of this. And really, I think it comes down to the whole discussion on lighting is, is what's hanging out there. Well, there's also the traffic. Uh, Um, Joe, Joe, there's also the usage too, and I know we were given some information, but I'm hoping that the applicant, either Mike or Jim, can just put on record exactly what the use of this building is going to be for. And given that this has gone through so many versions of what was originally spoken about to where we are now, 
Um, I just want to make sure that there's a public record of what the applicant is going to be using uh, this building for. Uh, Joe, can I speak? Can I speak to that? Hold on, Maureen. Okay. Did this, didn't, isn't this in the document somewhere? Um, yes. Yeah, so at the last meeting, uh, we had asked the applicant. Well, yeah, we had asked the applicant to make a clear statement in their application about what the proposed uses are, and um, the resubmission letter had a pretty good job of talking about this being a retail establishment. Uh, I've spoken to Mr. Fisher and Alyssa, and uh, we've asked for some notes to be put on the plan. Uh, I've asked in, the, in my memo, I've made some recommendations for actually tightening up those notes a little bit. I think um, there was general comfort level with this being a village retail lumbery establishment and the outstanding uh, concerns were with the use of the cutting room, the uh, use of outdoor display space, the use of the lawn area. Uh, the staff memo includes proposed conditions that um, the board may wanna look at to determine if that's getting them the level of comfort they need. Um, I don't know if the applicant has any comments on those proposed conditions, but um, the cutting room in particular, because it seemed to be more fluid um, I think we're, I, I've, I've worked with the code officer and um, we're both fairly comfortable that if this proposed condition is adopted, that it's, it's uh, clear enough about what exactly that use is going to be. Um, does that answer your question? I think so. Jonathan, does that answer your question? I mean, my... I sort of knew the answer to the question, but given that this, we have numerous members from the public and some who wrote us and expressed concern, some who, a lot who wrote us with support of the project as well, but I just wanna make sure that we are speaking to everybody who has, um, has, has an interest in this and I just wanna make sure it's on there. Okay. So, and Maureen, just so we're clear, are you talking about the, um, submission from Northeast Civil Solutions on July 2nd, 2020, the last page of that, where it sets forth what the ideas are? Um, I, I believe that um, there was a cover letter July 2nd, and I'm looking for what you're asking. And there's a lot, again, there's a lot of the old stuff here. Um, I guess it's just the first paragraph, basically the... I, I think I probably the best one is the last paragraph, the conclusion. Um, yeah, Michael Friedland would like to establish the Lumbery as a retail store that supports a need for products and services to be offered to the people of Cape Elizabeth. So it's a retail store. The store and site will not be used for a purpose other than retail sales and support and any proposal for additional uses would necessitate future board approval. Does Mike or Jim, do you want to add anything? So that coupled with a clear. Uh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll add to it. Um, basically, it's a, it's a small boutique building supply store with a social and environmental conscience. So, um, I could go on and on uh, about it, but it's really figuring out how to tap into the small Maine mills, family owned mills throughout Maine. Uh, where they Michael, I don't mean to cut you off, but uh, honestly, I think what the uh, code officer needs is just a very simple definition of whether this thing is retail. retail. And we, I think we've, it's stated on the drawings. Great. And Maureen, I assume, has Ben, ben has looked at that and is satisfied? Yeah, he, he's, he's looked at the drawings, but the, the thing I think that really, um, really wraps it pretty tightly is the motion that says you would be granting approval for 1,980 square feet of village retail. Okay. And then uh, with the note about the limits on the cutting room, uh, the entire building is village retail 
and only activities that are normally incidental and subordinate to village retail would be allowed in the building. So I think we're good on the use. Do you, you concur, Jonathan? I, I mean, from what's written, yeah, but uh, my, just my concern is something that was, I don't mean to, it was cut off from Michael, but he started talking about mill work. And what I don't want to have happen in this situation is all of a sudden this becomes the new Pond Cove Mill Works, which used to exist back when I was growing up in the town, um, where you could hear saws when you're- Oh, we're not a mill. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's what not we need. Not at all, not even close. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Okay. Um, in the uh, notes here, we say, it says the planning board may want the applicant to propose mitigation for the increased traffic it will contribute to the intersection. This is under the whole traffic study. And I'm not sure what mitigation you could offer other than cutting, uh, chopping out the brush it, uh, in the corner there. Um, I mean, it seems to me that really the only mitigation that would prevent accidents are traffic lights. And I mean, I, I don't think we want to go there in any way, shape, or form. Um, so I'm not sure what else to do with that. And I guess I would, I'm asking Maureen if uh, you care to elaborate. Yeah, so just, I mean, under site plan review, the burden is on the applicant to show that they have met the standards. The applicant has provided traffic analysis from Bill Bray, and Bill Bray said, there's traffic being added to an intersection that is currently identified as a high crash location on the state database, and therefore some mitigation may need be needed. So this is the difficult part of this. The burden is on the applicant to provide some mitigation recommendations. Uh, Joe, if I may, when I get to- Yes, you Jim, can... you may. All right, thank you. I spoke with Bill about that several times. And uh, his reference as a traffic engineer, and as we would expect a traffic engineer to do, is to take a look at the, uh, the overall intersection, regardless of you know, the issues of who's adding what to it or taking away from it, et cetera. His point being is that, as we all know, those of us who lived in Cape or, or certainly uh, spend a lot of time here, this intersection has been studied ad nauseum for decades. And nobody has really come up with an issue to be able to mitigate anything, primarily because of the uh, the directions or the offset where Shore Road and Scott Dyer Road come into Ocean House. So in terms of full mitigation, as uh, Joe basically mentioned, I think the only thing that you're looking at that might even be remotely possible to do that is a traffic light. And even there, the offsets of Shore and, and Scott Dyer on Ocean are so far apart that a traffic light would be very interesting. Um, having said that, please keep in mind too that uh, as a an old Cumberland Farms, this place had dozens of cars coming in every hour, not just the peak hours. For this use, we're looking in the peak hours, two vehicles, that's it. Both the morning and the evening, uh, late afternoon peak hours are estimated to, to uh, add two vehicles to either entrance, two vehicles total, so they can go out either way. That doesn't really lend itself to a lot of mitigation. As Joe mentioned, we can certainly do a, a correct step in terms of trimming the bushes that are out there, when we were on the site walk, we all saw that they were fairly set, set back fairly far. I mentioned from the actual stop bar at the intersection, I mentioned that to Bill, he certainly agreed, but he was saying overall, if there's anything to be done uh, as far as mitigation is concerned at all, it's typically um, allowing a longer site distance. Well, trimming those bushes, which we're happy to do, uh, would certainly do that. We don't really have much of a problem now, but they could be, there could be a substantial problem later. Other than that, you'll note on the traffic report that's a part of your study, the vast majority of the uh, intersection uh, crashes there are from people parked at Scarp Dyer at, at the Ocean House uh, intersection and shooting across trying to get into the gas station. So as far as uh, uh, any mitigation regarding people coming out of the entrances or going into the entrances of the Lumbery, that's really not an effect on this particular intersection. Bill was again just commenting on the fact that it's a problem area overall, something that the town, which we certainly know, uh, wants to just keep in mind and take a look at for at some point in the future. I'm really not too concerned. I never have been with the traffic to just re reiterate what Jim just said. 
it was a Cumberland Farms with a heck of a lot more traffic than this is going to be. So I've never been concerned about um, increased traffic because of this business. I can echo what Jim said as well. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so then in terms of the uh, uh, condition of approval, um, is the note, uh, is there a note on the drawings now? What is the note on the drawings about clearing the brush say exactly? There, there is a note there, Joe, and it does explicitly say that the vegetation will be trimmed to open up site distance. Um, staff have looked at it. We're satisfied the note meets the intent. Okay. Well, my feeling is that that would meet the finding. Uh, let me just grab the finding. So when we get to this, it seems that the applicant has provided a plan for mitigation of the project traffic. All right, any other thoughts on that? No, I'm good with that. Okay. Sounds good. So does that mean that uh, number four would get struck then if it's already done? I mean, this is condition for approval, but it's but it's already on there. Access to the element would be on roads of adequate support. Yeah, Access. you need to take that out. Wait. Access to the element. Where are you, Joe? Joe. I think they're talking about number four proposed condition of approval. Access to the development. Oh, oh yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah sorry. So they order. There. Okay, yeah. So you can take that out when we get to it, whoever reads it. All right. Anything else in these conditions to discuss other than the lighting? Joe, I have one, uh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I have one uh, comment regarding one of the other conditions, if I may. Yes. Uh, this is condition number six, talking about a preservation plan for the existing vegetation. Um, it's very simple to do. There's no issue. We don't have a problem with that. The, the, the issue really is, is that it doesn't really pertain in this case, because the only vegetation, there are no trees out there uh, in the area that we're proposing to be able to do any site work. Remember, the only area that we're proposing to do any uh, um, uh, removal of areas that would ostensibly affect trees is pulling up the pavement that is uh, uh, in that upper triangle or area up near uh, the intersection. So as far as that pavement is concerned, uh, you can't really do a, uh, a preservation plan on pavement. That pavement's got to come up. And once that pavement is up, there aren't, and the roots of the trees, if there are any underneath that, are well underneath that soil, and we can't disturb that soil anyway. And all of the other trees are actually not on our site or not in the area where we're proposing to do any work. So again, we can show something on a plan, but it doesn't you, pertain. Maureen, can you just go to the site plan that has shows the trees? Oh, you're on it. Just so in back of the building. Now this, if I may. Yes. Um, may. It's a pretty common requirement and I agree with most of what um, Jim Fisher said about they need to remove the pavement and um, they won't be disturbing the roots. The only thing I've seen unfortunately during some site development is under trees is a great place to store things and uh, storing equipment and materials underneath trees is a good way to compact the soil and kill them over time. So um, that's why I would still recommend that the preservation note be on the plan. Yeah, I think it's really just a note of what you would be doing anyway. We can certainly write a note uh, stating that there should be no, as Maureen just mentioned, and she articulated that in a note previously as well. We're happy yeah. to do that. All right, folks. 
I turn the big dollars. <laughs> what? What do you want to do about the lighting? I'm willing to uh, go with Peter Curry's compromise of one light. It's not. I, I'm not wild about it, but I also don't want to have zero lights because I think that ex that sets a precedent for future developments. It also, as we know, exposes a town to lawsuits from other property owners that did put in lights and may feel that we were holding them to different standards. And $10,000 a light will be peanuts that will go to the lawyers if we do get sued. So okay. anyway, I'm in favor of Peter. So company. one vote for one light. Anybody, should I just call on people for your vote? Carol Ann? Yeah. I, I could go with that. I, it's not my first choice. Peter? Yeah, I would, let me make a ranked choice vote. I suppose my first choice <laughs> would be for the one light, and my, my second choice would, would be Carol Ann's proposal, and with a number of, say, 10 grand or 7,500. Uh, contributed to a fund to install the lighting later down the road. Yeah, I don't know if I can do ranked choice voting on this. I would be happy with either of those two possibilities. Jonathan. Well, in the spirit of ranked choice voting, I think you'll probably be able to throw my first vote out, which is to require the three lights. Um, but I guess if my second choice would be what uh, Peter's suggestion about the the one light dan um my first choice would be the three lights similar to jonathan but um i would also be okay with the single light andrew uh yeah single light uh i think that would that would work out well wow well, i don't have to vote yeah <laughs> Oh, I'm gonna go. Oh, I say one. One. I I agree with the one light at and, the entry. And I and I'm not trying to be flip. You know, you put in one light and run power to it and have a light in there that works. Just I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. It's just I want to. All you know. right. I, I, I just I I do want to say something. Part of the reason that I am in support of the three lights is exactly what Jim talked about is setting that precedent and I know it's not required and I was inquiring whether or not we would need the town attorney to weigh in on this but it seems that it's something that's within our discretion and I think that past precedent has been to require the lights um, but I don't want to set a situation where other individuals in the town center come forward and say hey you didn't make them do the light you can't make us do the light so I think this is makes sense as a compromise okay are we ready for somebody to do a motion i'll do it hey jim oh boy wait can i yes may, may i just say something the, yeah i mean you're i still have concerns with regards to just the amount of conditions that are on this uh, this motion, and I think we're at least at eleven or ten, um, and so I, I I have a lot of concerns on that, and I don't want us setting up a situation where code enforcement is basically uh, base we put him in charge of uh, policing the applicant to make sure that all these conditions are in place prior to him opening his business. But I think that's what we're setting up, and I'm not. Uh, I'm in support of the business, but I'm not in support of passing a motion that has 10 or 11 conditions of approval as part of motion. So I just want to put that on record. Well, there is a, one of the uh, conditions is that a set of plans be submitted to the town with all of this information on it. So Maureen, I guess the question is for you. Is that, I mean, do you feel comfortable with that? Well, I, I, I'm glad you asked so that I can put it. 
on your your brain's standard practice more. with every oh, I'm sorry. Up on us. Um, start again. Okay. Am I can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So the standard practice with a conditional approval is that the applicant is required to revise the plans and perform all the actions to meet every condition and submit everything to the town planner. I provide copies to the town engineer for the things related to the town engineer. I coordinate with the town attorney if that's necessary. And all the conditions must be met before it's handed over to the code enforcement officer for issuance of any permits. And uh, in, I'm glad you asked because I uh, spoke with the code officer today. And um, to be clear, conditional approvals are done at the convenience of the applicant. Because once you have an approval, you're, not, you're no longer set in this once a month meeting with the planning board. You can hustle and get your conditions met as quickly as possible, submit a complete set of revised plans to the planner and move forward. It is the code officer's preference that there not be conditions on approval. He would rather the whole thing just be tabled, the plans be revised, and then resubmitted for the planning board approval next month. But here in Cape Elizabeth, we provide that courtesy to the applicant. But it is very important that everyone on site until any conditions on the planning board approval are completely satisfied. Did I break up then? A little bit. Got it at the end. It all. Okay. All right. So, uh, keeping that in mind, Jonathan, would you? Is that? Uh, does that satisfy you? I just say this, Joe. As an attorney, I, I, I live my life by precedents that are set, and as one of the supporters for. Uh, the applicant, I'm sure, understands that. And so I think we are setting a dangerous precedent by having this type of motion go through uh, that has this many conditions of approval. And that's my reluctance on it. And also what we discussed with regards to um, the lights. And so I, it's, it sounds like I'm the only one that has this concern. And so it might not play into the vote at all, but I just want to make sure I Put that on record because it is a concern of mine. What what would be the result? I mean, what I mean, ignorance on my part, Jonathan. Um, what could result from having all of these conditions that would not normally result? Well, one is that we're passing a motion that basically is going to lead to a lot of confusion. That we're going to have the code enforcement officer. Um, making sure that all these conditions, the applicant might think he's ready to open business tomorrow because his motion's ready to go. Um, and we get to the point where our, our role as a planning board is to make sure that every one of these applications that comes in front of us is, goes along with what the ordinance that the town council has put together. And so I get a little bit weary when we have an application that we have seen change over and over again uh, as me, this is, like I said, this is our fifth public meeting that we've been talking about this and, uh, we didn't really receive any new information tonight. It seems like it's been the most buttoned up that it has been, uh, since it came in front of us, which is, I, I think a compliment to the applicant and his team, uh, on putting this together. But that's just my concern, Jim. And, uh, we've seen motions before, uh, one that came up on a, uh, a, um, project that was over uh, near uh, Wells Road for a uh, tower that didn't get approved because it had conditions of uh, approval that were some people on the board deemed were too many. And so I think that to me set a precedent uh, on not having these things put together. And it's again concerning to me when I hear from the town planner that code enforcement would prefer that this be tabled uh, and it be set and basically put on the on the app uh, on the paperwork uh, the plan, and it'd be set and then brought back to us. Uh, so, like I said, no, that, those are no, my concerns. no way. This is uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, but I, I've about had it with this. Well, uh, uh, Joe, Joe, Jim, Joe, hold on. 
Well, if there's a point, if there's a point of clarification. Yeah, I, we haven't taken a vote yet, so. Could, could I make a I, comment, too? Pete. Yeah, um, and part is a question for Maureen. Is, as I look at this list, um, there, there are several conditions. I, it didn't strike me as an extraordinary long number of conditions compared to other projects we've had with complications. So I wasn't as put off by the number of, of conditions, nor do I find them to be particularly tricky or intricate or, or hard to uh, interpret. So I, I guess, Jonathan, I, I don't find them as problematic as you do. And Maureen, is this an unusually complex and, and lengthy list of conditions in your experience? Um, it's, it's a little on the long side. I feel completely confident that the conditions uh, can, can be met by appropriate revisions to the plan and resubmission of plans to me so I can verify that the standards, the conditions have been met. Uh, it just needs to be very clear that there can't be any activity on the site until this has been addressed. Yeah, I, I agree with Pete. I appreciate what you're saying, Jonathan, but I don't think I don't think these conditions are particularly tricky or difficult, and um, they're spelled out quite clearly. It's clear what needs to be done to the drawings, and I feel comfortable with this list of conditions. Um, and what I'd like, I, I mean, we don't have to go and ask each one of you, but I would, I'd like to get a motion going here, so. Joe, can I just ask one thing? Because Jim had a reaction to something I said. So I just yeah. find out what that was. I think I'm entitled because I wasn't sure okay. if I said something that was- Oh, like, Jim Fisher. Yes, not Jim Huebner, sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd just like to point out that when you take a look at this, con at this list of conditions, which in Cape Elizabeth perhaps is a little bit longer, in many other towns it's nowhere near as long as a lot of conditions. Um, but, uh, and I don't need to go through all of them, but many of them are very generic. Um, and, and for instance, the town engineer, the single town engineer's comment was, what kind of paver bricks are you going to put in the walk? Okay. You know, we're, we're talking about pavers. If he needs to see a picture, if the town wants to see a picture of a block, fine. That's one of them. Uh, notes on the plan regarding the cutting room. We've already got that in there. We can re-articulate that, but it's already stated. Uh, the VRAP, it's going to be a condition because we simply don't have it. Um, we can't change that. We, as far as the DEP is concerned, we've had, this is not germane to this particular project, but we've had projects into the DEP since January, and it's over six months and we still don't have them back. It's a weird time. The point being is that we may not get this VRAP for another couple of months. Obviously, uh, Michael can't do any work until we get there, but it also could come tomorrow. So that's an obvious condition. Number four, condition does not apply. Uh, we're talking about the uh, pedestrian lights yet. The preservation plan, that's a line on a drawing beneath the trees and a statement saying that there won't be any uh, heavy equipment stored there. These are all, my, my point being is that these are all very minor labeling changes. There's nothing in here of any great substance. Um, so as far as this is concerned, it's an average list. It's very easy to do. I would say we could, we as these from the civil side can comply with everything in here in one day um, in getting the note, the respective notes on the plan and getting that over to Marine. This is not a big issue for us. Okay. Hey, thank you, Jim. And one thing I just want to say though, too, I mean, usually as Jim, you know, is when we have something town stand or in the town center, we get samples of uh, the, uh, asphalt shingles and the siding and those types of things. And I don't think anyone here is asking for that on this application, but we, we get those details. That's usually how it comes into us. And that's fine. I don't have an issue with that, but if you want to see a picture of a brick, we'll be happy to give one to you, but that's the town. <laughs> I'm good. I'm not asking for a picture of a brick, but thanks. All right. As I was saying, does anyone want to make a motion? I'll try it again. I have, a motion, I have a motion for the board to consider, motion for approval, findings of fact, Michael Friedman, Fre Michael Friedland, DBA Yam Yams LLC is requesting site plan review for a 1,980 square foot village retail lumber store in the existing 
1,980 square foot building located at 287 House Road, which requires review under Section 19-9 site plan regulations. The following findings are subject to the applicant satisfying all conditions. Three, the planning board held a workshop at my Hope you that those texts aren't bothering you on my phone. Two, the plan Hold on. Uh, Can you stop a second? Is yeah. my I have a bell going off. Maureen, is that? That's mine. I get my phone. I'm I'm throwing my phone across the room because somebody's texting me and I'm trying to get it away from the microphone on the computer. Okay. So, Thank you. Number two, the go ahead. Oh, I thought somebody's Two, the planning board held a workshop on January 7th, 2020. Uh, meetings on February 24th, 2020. The application deemed incomplete April 21st, 2020. Application deemed complete May 19th, 2020. Public hearing held June 16th, 2020 and July 21st uh, today, 2020. A site visit was conducted on May 26th, 2020 at 6 p.m. Three, the plan for the development reflects the natural capabilities of the site to support development. Four, access to the development will be on roads with adequate capacity to support the traffic generated by the development. Access into and within the site will be safe. Parking will be provided in accordance with section 19-7-8 off-street parking. Five, the plan does provide for a system of pedestrian ways within the development. Six, the plan does provide for adequate collection and discharge of stormwater. Seven, the development will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion plan submitted. Eight, development will be provided with an adequate quantity and quality of potable water. Nine, the development will provide for adequate sewage disposal. 10, the development will be provided with access to utilities. 11, development uh, will not locate, store, or discharge materials harmful to surface or groundwater. 12, Development will provide for adequate disposal of solid waste. 13, the development will not adversely affect the water quality or shoreline of any adjacent, adjacent water body. 14, the applicant has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capability to complete the project. 15, the development will provide for adequate exterior lighting without excess illumination. 16, the, the development will provide a vegetative buffer throughout and around the site and screening as needed. 17, the development will not substantially increase noise levels and cause human discomfort. 18, storage of exterior materials on the site that may be visible to the public will be screened by fencing or landscaping. 19, the site and building design complies with the town center design requirements. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Michael Friedman doing business as Yam Yams LLC for site plan review to operate a 1,980 square foot village retail lumber store in the existing 1,980 square foot building located at 287 Ocean House Road be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the plan be revised to address the concerns of the town engineer in his later dated Seven, uh, July 14, 2020. Two, that under note, under notes, note two on the site and layout plan and on sheet AE100, note uh, regu regarding the cutting room, both notes be replaced with the following note. The cutting room shall be limited to occasional cutting of wood and wood products by retail store employees for retail store customers at the time of purchase, which shall occur during the hours the retail store is open to the public. Retail hours of operation are specified on the site and layout plan as Monday to Saturday, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. and Sunday, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Three, that the applicant obtain DEP VRAP phase two environmental site assessment approval for all proposed improvements to the site. Nothing shall be permitted to penetrate or remove the existing asphalt that is not included in the VRAP approval. Four, that the applicant install one town center compatible pedestrian light in the grassy uh, grass esplanade, uh, well, at the intersection of the sidewalk and the stone paver path. 
we can go back and talk about that after I'm done here if I need to refine that. I also want to add that electrical power be run to the light and it be operable. Uh, six, that a preservation plan for the existing, I mean, sorry, five, that a preservation plan for the existing uh, vegetation to be preserved be added to the plans. The preservation plan shall restrict disturbance of roots within the drip line of trees and no storage of materials shall be allowed within the drip line of trees. Six, that the note on the erosion and sedimentation control notes slash detail sheet under the plant schedule be removed or replaced with note four on the site and layout plan. Seven, that there be no display of materials on the lawn area, including the path installed in the lawn area. No activity shall be scheduled or programmed for the lawn without first obtaining approval from the planning board as a site plan amendment. Eight, that there be no outside storage of materials except for the lumber rack nor any storage containers unless they are shown in the approved site plan. Outside display of materials are only allowed on the concrete walkway in front of the building. Display materials shall be placed to preserve appropriate accessibility into the building and shall be removed when the retail store is closed. Nine, that there be no interior use or occupancy of the building without compliance with all building and fire codes as determined by the code enforcement officer and the fire chief. 10, that there be no alterations to the site nor building or any other local permit issued until the plans and materials have been revised to address the above conditions and a complete set of project plans are submitted to the town planner. The applicant must also provide a performance guarantee in accordance with section 19-9-4B4. Do I have a second? A second. Peter seconds it. Um, on, uh, I'd like to offer a uh, friendly amendment, Jim. Okay. On item five, it read uh, that the applicant install one town center compatible pedestrian light in the grass esplanade uh, along the developed Ocean House Road frontage of the property. This light shall be shown on the site plan. Okay, I can live with that. But I, and I, yeah. And I do want to add the part about running power to it. And okay. It, all right. I want to include that. All right. Let's see. How about that? The applicant install one town center compatible pedestrian light uh, in the grass. The light shall be shown on the site plan and the light shall be powered. Okay. In working order, something like that. Joe? Huh? Something along the lines of in working order. The light shall be powered and in working order. Okay. I think, I think uh, the light shall be powered. I mean, what are you trying to do? Discern it from a, a solar, solar powered light? No, I was actually thinking not have the power, but just say in working order. So, but uh, I'll go with what uh, I suggest. I Joe, does your amendment uh, place the the light near the intersection of the walkway? And uh, the no, not exactly. I guess we should do that. Uh, well, it's in the so in the esplanade about in the grass esplanade uh, at the um, mm -hmm. junction of the walkway and public sidewalk. Okay, I'll read this once more. Five, that the applicant install one town center compatible pedestrian light uh, in working order in the grass esplanade at the junction of the walkway and public sidewalk. Uh, this light shall be shown on the site plan. That's fine. 
Okay. All right, does any Peter, other? I was gonna say, does Peter accept that friendly amendment as well? I didn't hear oh, him. Thank so. you. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Great. Are we ready for a vote? I guess yes. that's a yes. Okay, Maureen. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Sorry to cut you off there, Joe. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Starbeck. No. Mr. Shalott. Yes. Measure passes. The application with conditions is approved. Thank you guys. Thank you all very much. It's been a long road. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. All right. So it's nine o'clock. Uh, I don't think the next item is terribly long. So does anybody object to moving on? Not at all. Wait, do we have a choice just to cut it off? <laughs> When's the cutoff? Nine or ten? No, it's yeah. ten o'clock. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I'm Still got now. an hour to go, Joe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Paul Stewart is requesting a private access way permit to make an existing lot located at the rear of 19 Feston Road buildable. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 1979 private access ways. So we'll begin uh, having the applicant introduce the project. Hi, Bob. Hi, good evening. Um, are you going to be, uh, are you going to be controlling the image or do you want Maureen to put yeah, it up? Maureen can put the image up. I would appreciate that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Probably because of our wonderful technology, I don't want to screw it up. <laughs> I think that's my job. I didn't say that. I did. So what are you, a pen, a pen and ink guy, Bob? Uh, well, somewhat, yes. <laughs> but everybody else in my office does all the CAD work, so I just get to mark it all up. So anyway, I can just kind of, when Maureen is starting to bring this up, as uh, Joe had indicated, this is a, we were with this, the workshop with the board we were looking at either a private road or a private access way and there was some discussion and interpretation with Maureen and Ben and after that it was uh, we came back that the resolution was it was to be a private access way so that's where we are from the workshop session and the lot is lot 19 is 19, it's 19 Pheasanton Road which is map 16 lot 21 it shows as one on the tax map with a division line that divides the two parcels. And there are two lots. Uh, lot two, which is the one that actually has a house on it, which I understand was moved there from Fort Williams back in the 50s. Uh, and that's a 19,125 square foot lot uh, that had come out of the Maxwell property. And then what is identified as lot one is the rear lot. And that also came out of the Maxwell farm property. And that was around 1978. So the two distinctly de described properties uh, and that lots 33,498 square feet. So when the plan comes up, I can kind of. I am sorry. It's I just, I'm getting there, I promise. That's okay. I'm just trying to push along anyway. Um, the existing resident is going to remain. Uh, they're going to renovate it. Uh, there's a center room in the back that they're going to be looking at actually rebuilding and, and expanding a little bit uh, to address the private access way requirements. The driveway, which is on the easterly side right now, where the private access way is going to go, will be relocated to the westerly side of the house. Uh, it'll come up along the side, and there'll be parking actually at the rear of the property. And I could show that when we go go forward. Uh, the uh, front lot is served by overhead power and other utilities. There's an existing water line to it. 
is an existing septic system that is going to be replaced. Uh, not sure, uh, Paul, if, I don't know if he's on or not, but uh, the age of that has just decided to replace that system and we provided the uh, HHE 200 forms uh, that Ben has reviewed for this. And the uh, proposed use uh, new lot will have under, oop, there we go. Sorry about that guys. Yeah, that's not a problem. So as we indicated the existing house uh, on the front lot, you see the triangular, it's triangular, the rectangular box that's kind of highlighted in there. The front lot's frontage is all on Pheasanton. The rear lot is a triangular wedge that runs down along the easterly side, which is what Maureen is highlighting. And that ties into the pin that's at the corner of Pheasanton. So that the rear lot, which is the larger piece, the 33,000 square foot lot, uh, there are two existing farm structures on there that will be either, re they will be removed from the site, whether they're being relocated or demolished. Um, we don't have a definitive answer on that at this point. Uh, the, as you can see on Pheasanton Road, there's an overhead uh, power line coming in from the southwesterly corner, uh, opposite road coming overhead to serve the house. We're going to be looking at and trying to coordinate with CMP, which with these COVID times, it's a, it's a challenge to deal with some of these utility companies to get any feedback. Paul's desire would be to uh, definitely run underground for the new lot from an existing pole under Pheasanton if possible, and then run the service for the existing house underground as well to eliminate that having an overhead service. But that is something we are still trying to work out with CMP. And the new water service would come in along the 30 foot access easement uh, to serve the property. And I'll get into more discussion about the water district in a minute. Uh, there's very limited uh, vegetation uh, in terms of trees and shrubs. There are a couple of shrub massings that are on the site uh, and there's a tree line to the western, northwesterly side along the, the rear lot. Uh, there's some shrub scrub growth that's in the foreground of the tree line. Uh, other than that, it's either ra uh, randomly mowed meadow or lawn associated with the front of the house, uh, with the front lot itself. So if you wanna go to the next plan, Maureen. So this is uh, showing the uh, proposed layout for the lot is to remove the, this is the dem existing conditions demolition. The hatched in areas, the existing limit of pavement for the current driveway, that'll all be removed. Uh, the shrubs that are along the south of uh, the westerly property line, they're on the abutters. Uh, speaking with Paul, there it was a, uh, an old aerial photograph that showed trees along that line. And as my understanding, those trees were on the abutters property. They were removed and they've replanted a whole uh, massing along there. So the, the vegetation we're showing there is approximate. They actually have not been field located, but to demonstrate there is some planting on that side. Uh, the shrub masses in the backyard uh, are probably going to wind up having to go. Some of them are Rosa Ragosa, I believe, uh, and those will probably wind up being removed just to address the uh, installation of new uh, septic system for both lots. Uh, we will preserve the tree line and the Shrub growth uh, in front of that tree line, there's a lot of invasive material in there. So we're, we're proposing that any invasives would be removed as part of the, the development of the property. If there's native materials, those will be retained, uh, but allowing that flexibility uh, to be able to put in a, a well-managed landscape on that side. Um, I think I can go to the, to the next one, Maureen. So this is the actual layout for the private access way. Uh, we're proposing a 12 foot wide uh, travel surface with two foot gravel, uh, grass gravel shoulders on either side. Uh, part of the waiver request is to be to the reduce that and I'll go through that when we discuss the waivers. Uh, we're showing a one and a half inch water service coming in to the new house in the back. That's an approximate footprint based on uh, a home that Paul and his wife are looking at building on this site uh, would bring the, as I said, the underground, uh, the underground utilities up the easement way to serve that house as well. 
What we have not shown on here is the emergency turnaround. Uh, we met with Chief Gleason. Uh, we had shown a layout with the emergency turnaround and pretty much uh, right opposite where the shows the proposed residence and says lawn area. In that 40 foot dimension there, the turnaround would have taken up just about that entire area in order for the turnaround to work. And similar to another project we had before the board for private access way a couple of years ago, we spoke with the chief, if a uh, NFPA uh, 13D residential uh, sprinkler system were put in the house, could we consider eliminating the actual turnaround uh, the driveway, which basically only serves this one house, there's no other access uh, off of this. And uh, he was uh, he was willing to entertain that, and I haven't seen any negative comments back that that isn't acceptable. So, so that's what the proposal is on uh, uh, as far as managing emergency service requirements. Uh, the new septic system for the rear lot is located in a triangular section where it says 25 foot setback and a 20 foot setback. There's a rectangular box in there. That's the proposed Leachfield uh, location for the rear house. And then to the right of that is a location for the new system to serve the front lot. Uh, as you can see, the driveway we talked about, it's a nine foot wide driveway coming in to uh, provide a couple of parking spaces at the rear of the property. Uh, we're proposing to do a supplemental planting along the property line. We're showing Looking at native materials, uh, they haven't been specified right now. They will be for the final plant, uh, but to create a shrub, shrub, shrub massing along that edge to provide some screening from the driveway in cars to the abutting property and complementing the, the mixed shrub material that they have planted on their parcel as well. Uh, in between the lot, front lot and the rear lot, we're showing a a shrub hedge, if you will, dividing between those two lots, uh, per some initial discussion we had with Maureen. And then along the easterly side, along the actual, within the easement and the rear lot, we're showing a, uh, a mixture of uh, shrub materials. And as we get towards the rear, introducing some evergreen and deciduous trees uh, due to the nature of the width of the uh, the easement area and the required grading and everything for the roadway, uh, shrub planting uh, is the what's being preferred. The other aspect is the owners of the farm really would like to have something along there that kind of clearly delineates the, the boundary line between this these two lots and the farm itself. Uh, there was some initial discussion just making sure it wasn't going to be uh, a habitat for critters that are going to go out and have dinner in the field, I guess. Uh, so. We're trying to find materials, native materials that will accomplish both of those. Uh, along the northerly property line, the farm wraps around that side as well. And partly for the screening for the farm, as well as for the new residents, we're showing a mixture with some deciduous and evergreen trees that we planted along the backside. And then, as I said, the existing tree line on the westerly side and some of that existing vegetation, and there is one tree isolated in there. Those will be preserved with the exception of removing any invasive materials. So. And on the grading, which is the next one down on the sheet. Uh, the sheet, yes, sheet. I'm getting tongue tied here, sorry. Uh, the property drops 12 feet from the northwesterly corner to the southeasterly corner. Uh, and what you know, currently the runoff is a sheet flow that heads down and across the properties and heads towards Pheasanton. Uh, the grading we're proposing for the driveway is to do a cross slope to sheet flow and create a, uh, a ditch line along the side with two rain gardens uh, that will pick up and treat some of the, the storm water coming through. Uh, the remainder of the site, which will be lawn or planting materials, uh, will still allow for infiltration to occur. It's a very sandy, loamy soil uh, and has good drainage capabilities. So uh, we feel as though that would be adequate enough to, uh, to do some treatment off the driveway as well as accommodate the rest of the, the runoff on site. Uh, what else have I got here? That I think is an overview of what is being proposed as far as the private access way and the, uh, the layout for that. Uh, we did try to keep the waivers short. Uh, I had 
set to my sheet, sheet here. Uh, we had uh, seven waivers and in reviewing Mr. Harding's uh, uh, review, a couple of those uh, he felt as though we probably didn't need waivers for. Uh, one was a full stormwater report. We'd done a stormwater narrative and he seemed to be fine with that narrative. So uh, didn't have, did not need to uh, do a full blown stormwater. And the other one was the waiver request for the installation of a closed drainage system. And his uh, determination on that is it's a private access way, not a private road, and that the closed drainage system on a private access way would not be necessary. So those would be two waivers that we would uh, drop from uh, the request. Uh, the waiver for serviceability from the Portland Water District, dealing with the utility companies these days is becoming quite cumbersome and difficult. They will not issue a letter of serviceability, although they said you can get water, until they see a, the design for the residential fire suppression system uh, before they issue that letter. Uh, we had received a, an approval letter from the district before in a similar situation in Cape, in which they were fine when we just cited what the uh, system was going to be, and they no longer will accept that. So that would be a waiver that would uh, still request uh, and as a condition of approval that once we, the house has been designed and the system, fire suppression system has been designed, we will get that letter from the water district and provide that to Maureen uh, to satisfy that requirement. Uh, so the ones that uh, we really uh, are looking for is the width of the travelway and the waiver of the turnaround uh, with providing the uh, fire suppression system. And an additional one that uh, Steve raised in his review is that the radius requirements at the street, uh, the town requires 20 feet. Uh, and he suggested we look at requesting a waiver on that. In reviewing that, I think we could probably change that to a 15 foot uh, radius would improve some of that turning but a 20 foot takes quite a bit of frontage out of it. And really it's only serving one lot. So we'd request uh, a waiver to reduce that to 15 feet from 20 feet per the town standards. So I think that's an overview and the result of the, the waiver request. Uh, we did receive Maureen and Steve's reports. They've gone through all of the, uh, their comments and uh, uh, changes to the plans uh, that they, we need to have documented and if there are no issues with the, uh, those comments and we would uh, have the plans revised uh, to address all of those, including some of the documentation regarding the easement rights uh, to serve uh, the rear property. Uh, and uh, actually the, the descriptions of the easements have already been drafted. We just haven't uh, put them together in Maureen's comment of whether to put it in the maintenance agreement or as a separate easement, I'll talk to her which her, what preference uh, she would prefer to see uh, that description uh, put in. So uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, does anybody have any quick questions on the matter that would pertain to the completeness of the application? Okay, seeing none, uh, the meeting is now open to public for comment on completeness. Maureen, are there any, uh, is anybody indicating a desire to speak? We have six attendees at this time and no one has raised their hand. If somebody wants to speak, you should really click on the raise hand and then I can let you speak. Still not seeing any raised hands. Okay, seeing none, the meeting is closed. To uh, one second, Joe. Yeah. Uh, one question for you. This is, um, there's two phone-in listeners. Yes. Who can't probably raise their hands. So I don't have any idea how you deal with that per se. Oh, um, perhaps you might just need to unmute them and ask them if they have a comment or not. Actually, I think Andrew, with Zoom, you I think you press like star six or something like that. Okay. Well, all right. So I've just clicked on the one two oh seven. Yeah, we see 10, that. And six eight five three talking permitted. Do you want to speak? No. Okay. Thank okay. you. And I'm going to click on the uh, the one ending zero nine zero two. Do you want to speak? Do I speak? 
I don't want to be. Okay, sounds like a no. All right, we'll take that as a no. Public comment is closed. Um, oh, they were asking something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought I had to do that. Ah, the wonders of Zoom. <laughs> we should probably mute them before they say bad things about us. I <laughs> have to. <laughs> All right, it looks like they, they're muted. They are now muted. No, wait, like, this no. one. Got... Yeah, I was on a Zoom meeting for another planning board meeting, and a couple forgot to mute themselves, and they were talking about what they were cooking for dinner. <laughs> Could have been worse. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, anybody have any questions on completeness? Great. Can I have a motion, please? I'll do it. I like these short motions. <laughs> um, to be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Paul Stewart for a private access way for an existing lot located at the rear of 19 President Road be deemed complete. Second. Maureen, uh, does anyone have a comment? Question, okay, Maureen, please call a roll vote. Sure, Mr. Badensky. Yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Mr. Shalott. Yes. Okay. Um, does anybody feel we need a sidewalk for this? I'm inclined that way. Would yes. I could go either way since I live right up the street and I'm familiar <laughs> with the property. But I'll, if you guys want to go, I'll go. I think it would be good. Jim, you're not going to get lost walking down there, are you? No, no, I'll do my best. Okay. <laughs> I got a compass. I heard that. I heard that's a tough neighborhood. So. <laughs> All right. Well, we need a time. I can video it again. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> uh, after five thirty. Most any evening. How about next Tuesday, since we don't have a well? I, I, I was going to be on vacation next week. That's okay. okay. He's just throwing out ideas. And uh, I uh, also, and I told Maureen this this morning. I think it was this morning. Uh, our daughter in Canada had our second granddaughter four oh. weeks ago tomorrow. Oh. We're still trying to figure out how to cross the border. And, uh, <laughs> so our tentative schedule was leaving Saturday and going to be gone for a month. A month. Month. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got a quarantine, complete isolation for 14 days. Huh. You can't even come out of the door, supposedly. And uh, but anyway. Are you so, going to go up north and run across the border? Is that what you're going to do? Yeah, I don't know. Well, we found out something disturbing today that it's up to the discretion of the, bo uh, the border guard when you go to cross whether or not you meet the criteria to pass over. But that's another oh, story. God. Anyway, but I can have Julia from our office. Uh, do the sidewalk so we can get everything set up before if I'm not going to be here next next week if it has to be next week so do do we want to try and do it this week I, I, I'm just throwing I that also out. Thursday night Thursday I have two planning I have a selectman's meeting and a planning board meeting back to back between six and nine on Thursday so I could do tomorrow meeting. evening yeah. anybody around for tomorrow I cannot do tomorrow evening Mm -hmm. Should I say Friday? I can't be here. I can't do Friday. How about how about next Tuesday? I think Maureen's going to be on vacation. Maureen's it's all right. We, no, we can do it. We can do it. Oh, sorry, Maureen. No, it's it's. Uh, I have to come in to get your planning board package done. It's not that big a deal. We just won't be able to see Bob because he'll hopefully be in Canada. All right. And if I if I don't make it across the border, I'll be there on Tuesday. <laughs> So the 28th is the Tuesday. Mm -hmm. and what time was this? 5.30. 5.30. Yeah. Okay. No, er no earlier than 5.30. Yeah. No, that would be better. Okay. 
And uh, oh, I see a chat thing that says the Stuarts won't be available. Well, I haven't talked to Paul, but if he feels the need to be there, then we can rearrange it. But uh, I know what the board is looking for in terms of just identifying where the, the right of way is and where the center line of the road is. Do you need to see where the proposed building footprint is going to be located or just the access way? We don't need to see the proposed footprint. Okay. We okay, just want the end. He's a, he said he's okay to proceed. So yeah, he did. Okay. Um, and also the driveway for the, the new driveway. Yes, we'll have those laid out. So it'll either be Julia from my office or I'll be there subject to. What was the time again? 530. Okay. And the board has uh, some rules about site visits and the state uh, COVID-19 precautions have been changed since then. Do you want to stick with the rules you have for now? Do you want to revise them? What, I think, what's different? Yeah, I think what's different? The number of people that are allowed. Exactly, there. the number of people. So um, before you were capped at 10, which meant the public could not attend. Um, now there is no cap, but I would assume you would want everyone to wear a mask and uh, try to maintain some social distance. I would rather system. keep it capped at 10. Can we, if we can do that. Oh, I, I can do well, the video I, again. I, I, would, I would suggest opening it up to the public so Maureen wouldn't have to do the video. Oh, okay. I think public access is important. Might get it better. Yes. All right. Well, as long as everybody wears masks, Mask and social distancing. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. So next Tuesday, 28th at 530. There is one other thing I missed on the waivers. We had requested a waiver for the <clears throat> center line of the access way, but uh, after I had met with Maureen and Ben, we determined where the, <clears throat> excuse me, the break off limits for the private access way were. And the, the roadway is totally centered within the private access. It wasn't until we got closer to the house where the driveway started to shift to the, uh, to the westerly side. So we do not need that waiver anymore, so. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you all. I have a uh, motion, Joe. Yeah, thank you. Um, motion to table, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted in the facts presented, the application of Paul Stewart for a private access way for an existing lot located at the rear of 19 Fezzenden Road be tabled to the regular August 18th, 2020 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. Caroline seconds. Discussion? Uh, Maureen, please take a roll vote. Roll Mr. Podensky? Yes. Mr. Curry? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hubner? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Ms. Sar Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. Mr. Shalott? Yes. Vote is unanimous. Thank you, Bob. Have a great month. I'll still be working remotely, but you know. Good luck getting my, over the border. My computer shows up by Friday, but anyway. You, you can still zoom in, can't you? <laughs> oh yes, I can't hide. <laughs> All right, well, thanks. It's easier to get over the border than in the Handmaid's Tale, right? Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Thanks. Good night now. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Got another motion that may be a, a unanimous. I, I have a motion, Joe, before. It's a motion that Jim Hubner has to shave his beard. <laughs> I hear Liz in the background going, second. <laughs> she thinks it's uh, second. Oh, no. All right, hold on. I lost my, uh, oh, wait, here it is. I think that's it, right? Yes. 
we just have, oh, here we go. And planning board, digital remote operations. The planning board will review meeting logistics and upcoming items. Anything, Maureen, you need to tell us about upcoming items? I am very, very happy and relieved to report that around 11.15 last night, the town council voted in a special meeting to refer the short-term short rental amendments to the planning board for review. So that'll be on your workshop for August 4th. And also um, an application will begin from CELT for some uh, bridge construction over RP wetlands. I feel a fever coming on. I don't think I'll be able to no. <laughs> Maureen, yes. uh, I am going to be uh, out of town for all of August. Uh, hopefully able to actually remotely attend these meetings but it also means please do not send any materials to my house which will just sit on the front porch for a month and alert everybody that I'm not there. I will do my very best to remember that. Thanks. In Andrew's house. <laughs> Party. All right anything else? I have a sure if you notice anything on his porch, take care of it, would you? Just burn it. Just burn <laughs> it. All right. Well, anybody like want to make a motion, motion to adjourn? Uh, second. Maureen. Mr. Bedensky. Uh, yes, time to adjourn. Mr. Curry. <laughs> yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Go, baby. <laughs> Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. And Mr. Shalott. Yes. It is unanimous. Good to see you guys. All right. Have a good night. Everybody. Good night. So, yeah.